Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us. My name is Dr. Marguerite Beckford. I'm the Commercial Horticulture Extension Agent in Sarasota County. And before we get started, I'm so happy you're here. Um, I just like us to start with a good morning to our fellow Zoomers. So in the chat box, just type in where you're joining us from and good morning to your fellow Zoomers. And so here I am going to type in good morning from, I would say sunny Punta Gorda, but it's not sunny. <laughs> from not so sunny Punta Gorda. So good morning, Ivan, Sandy, Sherry, Sharon, Sue. Good morning, so happy you could join us. Good morning, the Farrell family. Perfect, I'm so happy to see you all and happy you could join us. It's really great. Um, so while the good mornings are coming in, oh, that's so cool. Um, Sue, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. My name is Marguerite, so people butcher my name all the time. So I feel your pain. <laughs> um, your in-laws live in Punta Gorda, that's great. All right, so good morning, Kay. And while the good mornings are coming in, I am going to stop my video because normally when I do presentations, I get distracted by seeing myself on video. It's like talking to myself in the mirror. So it's very distracting. Um, so I'll, I'll stop my video as we get started. And I must warn you, if you've never taken a class with me before, I love corny jokes. And so um, I'll be slipping in some corny jokes every now and then, okay? All right, so let's get started. And I'm so happy to have you. Good morning. All right. So today's session is going to be on pruning simple solutions. And I started off by um, having this topiary as a, you know, kind of like a symbol of simple pruning. <laughs> um, because, you know, you just follow the shape and you're good to go. Um, so typically though, um, pruning is not as simple as, you know, just following the shape on a topiary. Um, but the goal of today's session is to make it, if not as simple, a little simpler. Okay. All right. So before we start any session, we always like to go over what is extension. I know some of you might be master gardeners and you know all about extension, what it is. But believe it or not, we hear all the time how extension is a best kept secret. So, you know, people come to our office or they call us for advice on plants or whatever. And we give them advice and they say, oh my gosh, you guys are the best kept secret. And we're like, no, we don't wanna be a secret. And so we always start with an overview of what extension is. And so um, I work with the Sarasota County Extension Office, but extension is a partnership between each county government in Florida and the University of Florida and the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and so it's a partnership to extend the research that is conducted at the land grant university for Florida to the community um, through classes, outreach opportunities, volunteer opportunities. And our goal is to provide practical education to residents, professionals, decision makers, and um, pretty much anyone in Florida to help them, you know, make better decisions about whether it's plant care, whether it's nutrition, whether it's, you know, child care. Um, that's really our goal. All right. So what I love about extension, I'm not going to tell you it's my favorite thing because in a few more minutes, I might tell you, oh, this is my favorite thing. And um, I get teased a lot about this is my favorite plant. And then, you know, a few minutes later, that's my favorite plant. And people will say, but you know, you can only have one favorite. And I'm like, when it comes to plants, no, I can't have one favorite. Anyway, so 
One of my favorite things about extension is that we are a nationwide network of um, service based um, organizations. And so I told you it's a partnership between the USDA, the state, and the county governments. Um, if you see my arrow here, way, way back, um, there was a federal act that started land grant universities and each state got federal monies to establish a land grant university because what the federal government was trying to do was trying to protect the national food supply from disruption such as what happened in, in, in Ireland with the, the potato famine. And so their goal was to give each state funding to have a land grant university that would be able to do research to support farmers in an effort to protect the food supply chain. And so if you've ever lived in any other state, this is a map of your land grant university that's responsible for extension in that state. Um, in the state of Florida, University of Florida is a land grant university, which is why we are an extension of the University of Florida. And the University of Florida has an extension office in every county in Florida. Um, if you lived in New York, the extension University there would be Cornell, it would be Penn State in Pennsylvania, it would be Texas A&M in Texas, et cetera, et cetera. So we are part of a nationwide network of extension organizations that our goal is to extend university research to the residents of the state. Okay, so that's us in a nutshell. In um, our Sarasota County office, this is just a summary of the educational programs we offer. Today we're talking about horticulture. Um, so Florida friendly landscaping, as I mentioned, some of you might be master gardeners, but we also offer programs on protecting Florida's natural resources through the Florida Master Naturalist. Um, we offer education programs on protecting our water bodies through our Florida Water Stewardship Program, our Lake Watch Program, where we have um, citizens monitoring the water quality in, in various um, water bodies. We have our Sea Grant program and our Microplastic Awareness program, which provide education on sustainable fishing and um, how to protect marine environments from pollution. We have programs on sustainable living, so solar energy, um, green recycling kind of um, sustainable resources, I should say, for um, making your life more environmentally friendly. We do youth programming through our 4-H program, and then we do health and nutrition programming through our family and nutrition, our family nutrition program, and our family and consumer sciences program. So in a nutshell, this is what your extension office offers, um, whatever county you're in, and um, we're just happy that you're here. And we hope that now you know we're not a secret, you will spread the word so we no longer continue to be the best kept secret. All right, so let's begin with some excitement. <laughs> um, we always like to do a little pre-test poll just to see where you are, um, knowledge-based. Do you know a lot about pruning? Do you know nothing? Do you know a little bit? Um, whenever we do extension programs, we we, we like to say we teach to the middle of the audience. There's some in the audience will know a lot and there was some in the audience that will know a little and then there was some who will know maybe nothing at all. So we like to um, teach to the middle. So here is our pre-test poll. It will come up on your screen and then you vote. And there are four questions. So if you only see three, scroll down and you will um, see the fourth question. And so just type in the poll there. First question, pruning can contribute to plant health problems. You can't get this wrong. It's a pretest. You know, if you're not sure, say, I have no idea. Okay. All right. Keep voting. We like to have these polls to keep it interactive. So, um, 
you know, if we were teaching in person, we would be picking on you. So this is our way to pick on you virtually. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But we do like to get your feedback and um, just keep things interesting as you vote, get your votes in. I'm going to give you like 10 more seconds to vote, get the hang of it. Sometimes it's hard if you're on a phone or you're on an iPad to kind of find out, okay, where is the voting button? Okay. Perfect. Almost everyone has voted. All right, great. So some people aren't sure. Some people are very sure. I like it a lot. You know, um, the answers are, I'm going to share the results. And then we'll have a pre, we'll have a post test. So there, um, you'll see what the answers are. They were kind of like all over the map. And then as we go on, you will see um, the answers change. Maybe some people who are not sure will become more sure. And um, as we go forward into the presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing the poll and dig right in to the meat of the matter. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right, so let's start at the beginning. I think that's a good place to start. <laughs> um, when you design the landscape, properly, you can prevent future pruning problems. This is an example of, you know, a tree that's meant to be what, 30 feet wide, planted in a tree island that might be 15 feet wide. And yes, we understand that, you know, tree islands have to keep parking lots cool, but they could have used smaller trees and have avoided all these cuts. So you'll see these, these pruning scars all over these trees. These pruning scars are there because the tree was just getting too big for the island and interfering with traffic. And so they had to like prune the heck out of these trees. Um, and this could have been avoided if they had just planted smaller trees. And so that's why we say start at the beginning when you're putting in a plant, figure out how big is this plant going to get? Do I have enough room to put this plant here? If you don't do that, then you're just going to be fighting with the plant on a constant basis, pruning it to keep it within the size you want it to be. All right. So pruning considerations. You should always figure out what is the objective of pruning? Is it, am I pruning it for health? Am I pruning it because I want less flowers, less fruit? Um, am I pruning it to maintain a certain size or a certain shape? Um, you want to also look at proper pruning techniques, which is what we're going to go over in a bit. Um, you want to consider at what time of year does it bloom? Does it fruit? because you don't want to prune, if you're looking for flowers and fruit, you want to prune it prior to the fruiting and blooming season. And so these are some considerations of when to prune and how to prune. You wanna prune plants prior to their active growth season you want to make sure that you have the proper tools that the pruning job will require. You want to make sure that you have the capacity to carry out the pruning job. So if you're if it involves heavy overhead limbs, do you have the right equipment? You don't want to get concussed because you were trying to prune a heavy limb. Will it require a bucket truck, a ladder, a pole saw? You have to take into consideration all of these factors before pruning. Okay. So 
The strict definition of pruning is selective removal of plant tissue. And as I said, sometimes your objective can be to improve the health of the plant. So if there's um, there are sections of the plant that are diseased or full of aphids, um, you might want to prune that section off to improve the health of the plant. You might want to improve the plant structure. So you might have trees that are developing what we call co-dominant leaders, and these are prone to damage during high wind events. So you want to improve the structure. Um, when we're talking about horticultural or agronomic management, do you want less fruit that are larger in size? Then you might want to prune, um, prune off some of the blossoms. And so you'll have fewer fruit, but each fruit will be larger. Um, pruning objectives can also include public safety or an aesthetic value like that butterfly topiary um, I showed you at the beginning. Okay. So when you pick up some pruners, think about the objective of pruning. You know, um, corny joke alert, <laughs> when we had a statistics professor, you know, first, first session in the, in the semester and he's introducing himself to us. And he said, statistics are about groups and grouping groups into groups. And so, in, it has been my experience that there are two groups of people. There is one group of people who have something to say. There's another group of people who have to say something. And so um, you want to be in the group of people who have something to say. Um, and so I tell you this corny joke because you have two groups of people who prune. People who have something to prune and people who have to prune something. You don't want to be in the second group. You don't want to be in the group that has to prune something. You want to always be in the group that has something to prune. And so when you pick up your pruners, you, know, you should have an objective in mind. Is it to shape the plant, size it, to invigorate new growth or encourage um, a hedge to grow wider instead of taller? Is it to increase light penetration? Um, you know, sometimes when you have planting beds below large trees, the trees are not providing enough, allowing enough light to get through to the flower beds and so you're not having any flowers. Is the purpose of your pruning to mitigate storm damage? Is it to remove dead or dying or diseased tissue? So you must have something to prune. All right. So when you're pruning, the first thing, and I'm going to show you some diagrams to kind of make this, um, you know, come alive when I, when I make these points. So it's not just abstract. But when you're pruning, you want to locate the point of origin before the branch removal. So you want to go all the way back to the main trunk if that's what you're doing, or you want to go all the way back to the main stem if that's what you're doing, if that's what your objective is. You want to make angled cuts above each node. I'm going to show you what that looks like. For large limbs, you want to make two cuts prior to the final cut. I'm going to show you what that looks like as well and you wanna mitigate any damage from falling limbs. All right, for um, other types of pruning objectives, so for example, people who are producing herbs, they will pinch off the, the apical bud to increase lateral buds to grow. Um, are you heading back? Are you making a reduction cut? a thinning out cut or a removal cut. I'll show you what all of these look like, but the goal here is to alert you to the fact that when you're pruning, there is an objective in mind. It's not, you know, oh, I feel like pruning today. Let me go prune something. All right, so I talked about pinching and I gave you an example of, you know, you're growing herbs, so you're pinching back your basil because what you want to do is um, 
when you pinch back the terminal bud, it will encourage more branching of the lateral buds, okay? So pinching is really removing the soft tips of new shoots up to three inches, and it will encourage lateral branching. So just a bit of um, plant anatomy and morphology here. Plants are described as having three different types of leaf arrangements. And if you're a master gardener, you've, you've done this before. If you've done any kind of plant science, you might have studied this before. But as I said, in extension, we teach in the middle of the audience. So we don't assume that you do know it or you don't know it. So plants will have what we call an alternate arrangement where there is at each node, the node is the growing point um, of where the leaf attaches to the stem. At each node, there is only one leaf and the leaves are arranged in alternate patterns. So this leaf um, is on the left side of the stem and this leaf is on the right side of the stem and it goes that way. So you have your alternate arrangement. And as it goes up, at the top of the stem, you'll have a terminal bud. And these are called lateral buds. The opposite leaf arrangements, if you look at a plant, it might also have a different kind of arrangement, not alternate, but opposite leaf arrangement, where at the node, you have two leaves opposite to each other. And that's why it's called an opposite leaf arrangement. At, and then the third type of leaf arrangement is a world leaf arrangement where at the node, you have more than two leaves. Sometimes you'll have three leaves, sometimes you'll have five leaves um, connected to the stem at the node. And that's called a world leaf arrangement. So this is just some basic background that will help you to understand some terminology as we go forward um, and talk about pruning. And yes, um, I did forget to mention that, type your questions into the chat box. And then as we're going through the polls, I will um, go through questions in the chat. And um, Sherry asked if you can get a copy of the presentation. Yes, um, typically we give you a PDF copy via email. So, you know, select, private message to me so everybody doesn't have your email so select on to me <laughs> panelists and not everyone and type your um email address in the chat box and um i'll have your email address and i'll send you the presentation okay all right so now that we looked at how leaves are arranged on a plant let's look at different types of pruning cuts based on your objective. So here is a tree. Um, your objective is to do what we call heading back cuts, okay? So this is what it looked like before. What we're doing is we are lowering the height of the tree by making heading back cuts. And so what we do, for example, is we follow the, so we're gonna remove this, but we head it back to the main branch. So e everything in blue has been cut back to the main branch, cut back to the main branch. So that's what you're using your heading back cuts to remove the terminal tips of the branches, okay? Your reduction cut is actually what you're trying to do. You're reducing the length of the entire limb. And so this is what the limb looked like before. And you're doing a reduction cut where you're reducing the length of the limb. And so you go all the way back and you'd cut here, okay? So this is what your reduction cut looks like. And it shortens the length of the limb by cutting it back to a smaller limb. Okay, this is what your before and after 
picture looks like when you're doing a reduction cut. And you can see pretty much the canopy is going to be thinner once the tree comes out of dormancy. You'll have leaves on these branches, but you'll have fewer inner branches. So you'll see that the branches have been reduced all the way back to the smaller limbs. Okay. So one goal of a reduction cut is to prevent heavy limbs from sharing. And so pretty much what happened here is that, you know, you had really heavy limbs going out. There was a wind event and the weight of the limb caused sharing where the limb just tore the bark off. And so that's one objective of your reduction cut. So say this branch here, you know, you could actually make the branch shorter, which would put less pressure on the branches that are closer to the center of the canopy and avoid um, limb sharing. Okay. Thinning out is actually not just reducing the length of the limb, but you're actually cutting the branch back to the point of origin. So if you see here, this has been cut back to the point of origin. This here has been cut back to the point of origin. And so you're thinning out the canopy by cutting it back to the point of origin. And so the canopy on your right picture is thinner than the canopy on the left. And as I mentioned, feel free to type in questions in the chat and we'll get to them when we launch our polls. Okay, so a removal cut is when you cut the branch all the way back to the main parent branch. So you've actually removed the entire limb and that's your removal cut. Um, removal cuts tend to be done when you have co-dominant leaders and you're trying to train your tree to just have one central leader. Okay, so removal cut. Here you're just removing these branches and you're trying to get one central leader. All right, so now that you've figured out what your objective of pruning is, this is what you want to do when you start pruning, okay? You want to avoid making flush cuts. I'm going to show you what that looks like. You want to avoid creating a stub. <laughs> I'm going to show you what that looks like as well. You want to avoid branch collar injury. You want to use triple cuts for heavy branches. Yes, I said that before, but typically we like to repeat ourselves, not because we're going crazy, but because um, Repetition is helpful when um, trying to convey information for um, training purposes, okay? You want to use a bypass pruner instead of an anvil pruner for heavy pruning jobs or um, woody shrubs. And you want to do any kind of heavy pruning, pruning where you know, you're know you removing um, a lot of the foliage material. You want to do that just prior to the start of the growing season or at the beginning of the growing season. Okay, so we said to you, you don't want to leave stubs. So the picture on the right, you do not want to have this because the bark cracks, it doesn't heal properly, and um, or I should say it doesn't seal properly. And then you um, leave the, pro the tree prone to um, fungal and bacterial diseases entering. So you want to have a clean cut. You don't, you want to avoid injuring the branch collar. And the branch collar is that area of swollen tissue between the branch 
and the trunk. This branch collar is made up of a cross section of vascular tissue. And so when you talk about plant physiology and plant anatomy, I like to say that just as how we have blood vessels that transport you know, nutrients and water from our brain to our heart, to our toes, fingers, et cetera, plants are the same way. They have vascular tissue that run up and down the trunk and along each of the branches, okay? Your xylem tissue transports water from the roots upwards and your phloem tissue transports food that's made in the leaves of the tree up here, transports food from the leaves down to the roots. Your branch collar is an intersection of vessels that are running vertically and vessels that are running horizontally. And so you have this convergence of vascular tissue here, and that's what's happening here in this branch collar. That's why you have that swollen ridge. You want to avoid injuring the branch collar. And when I say injuring, when you prune, you're actually injuring the plant, but you're doing it for a good reason, hopefully, okay? When you prune this branch off, the you injure the plant. The plant knows that it has become injured and then it will work to seal off the wound. If you cut into the branch collar, the, the plant has to work twice as hard to seal off the wound because vessels running vertically have been injured and vessels running horizontally have been injured. And so the vessels running vertically have to seal and the vessels running horizontally also have to seal, which prolongs the sealing period. And if any, any prolonged sealing period means that the wound stays open that much longer, which makes the tree susceptible to pathogens. And so that's why you wanna make a pruning cut on the outside of the branch collar. I will show you what to do if your branch collar is not as obviously swollen as the picture on the left. Sometimes it's barely a blip. <laughs> you can't even see it, but we show you what to do if it's barely a blip. Okay, so when you're pruning large branches, you wanna make a triple cut Okay, your um, first cut is an undercut, okay? So working about 12 inches away from the main trunk, you make an undercut, which is, does not go all the way through the branch. It goes like a third to a halfway through the branch, okay? Undercut is your first step. Then further out from the first cut, you make a second cut, which is your top cut, okay? This will act as a fulcrum when you make your final cut on the outside of the branch collar. And so if the branch is gonna topple, it topples and stops here rather than tearing off the bark from the main trunk, okay? And let me just go back. So if you do cut into the branch collar, that's what we call a flush cut. And that's what we don't want you to do. We don't want you to make a flush cut. We want you to cut on the outside of the branch collar. Okay. This is what I meant if your branch collar is quote unquote invisible and you can't see it, it's not swollen. This is what you will do, okay? First, you find where the branch meets a trunk. And this is your bark ridge line, okay? Your branch bark ridge is here, okay? So you can get a Sharpie, red, orange, purple, black. You mark that. Then you're gonna draw a line. You can, it can be an imaginary line if you want to, or you can use a Sharpie as well. From the bark, from the top of the bark ridge, 
you're going to draw a line parallel to the trunk. So parallel to the trunk, you draw a line. You're going to measure the distance between your bark ridge and this parallel line to the trunk. Measure that distance, okay? So the distance between the imaginary line and the bark ridge is one measurement. Then you're going to measure equal distance from that line and equal distance from that line becomes where you will cut. So equidistance from that imaginary line is where you draw your line and that's where you'll cut. That is on the outside of your branch, of your quote unquote invisible branch collar. And once you get the per point, um, you'll be able to spend more time looking at that picture. But I want us to try to get through everything on time, okay? So as I mentioned, up close and personal in real life, the branch collar is barely swollen, barely. You can barely see it. It's not bulging like um, other branch collars would, okay? But you locate the branch bark ridge. Try saying that three times. <laughs> the branch bark ridge, you locate that. You draw a straight line down parallel to the trunk. So you see here. You do not cut anything on the inside of this line. Leave it alone. <laughs> you measure the distance between the, the branch bark ridge. I told you I couldn't say it three times. <laughs> then equal distance from this line is where you would cut, okay? That's where you would cut. All right. So if you make a good pruning cut on the outside of the branch collar, so it's not a flush cut, you did not cut into the vertical vascular tissue, it will seal and form a round shaped wound. So this is a good cut outside of the branch collar. You can see on either side, the branch collar is swollen, good cut. When you make a bad cut, as in it was cut flush with the branch, that's why they call it a flush cut, because you cut, you cut it flush with the branch, it does not seal as a circle. It seals as an oval because what happens is that it will first close, the wound will first close on the top and the bottom. I'm sorry, it will first close on the sides so you'll see the sides are all closed over, but then the top and the bottom are slower to close. And so you have this oval shaped wound that takes longer to close because as I said, the vertical tissues have to seal and the horizontal tissues have to seal. So you just have increased your sealing time, which means that all the exposed tissue is, is susceptible to pathogens, okay? So here again, our good cut on the outside of the branch collar. This is what it looked like when it was fresh. This is what it looks like a year later. You have the wound wood. <laughs> growing evenly around the wound. Try saying wound wood fast three times. Okay. All right. There was a time, and that's why extension is affiliated with research universities, because our tree researchers, horticulture researchers, they do the research. We get research updates all the time. Um, and then we pass the research updates along. So there was a time when they would recommend that you paint over um, pruning wounds with pruning paints, et cetera. That research has now indicated that it's better if you don't paint over um, 
pruning wounds, okay? Because sometimes what the pruning, pruning wounds can do is that they can trap moisture on the inside of the pruning wound and um, that will hasten disease um, and decay. All right, so remember at the beginning, I said we need to have an objective when we're pruning. Um, this is a rhetorical question, so nobody answer, but what was the objective here? Seriously. Um, you know, we got this picture from one of our um, tree researchers and all the agents are looking at it and going, what the heck? Seriously, what was the objective? Um, so this is what you should not do, <laughs> okay? Don't do this, don't try this at home. We don't know if they were trying to thin the canopy out because they haven't headed back. So for example, this branch where my arrow is, if they were trying to reduce the canopy or to thin the canopy, this branch should have been headed back here, okay? This branch or this branch should have been headed back. We don't know what was going on here. I think somebody just was in that group of people who have to prune something and that's what they did. They had to prune something, so that's what they did. This is totally inappropriate. Um, especially for trees, because trees are long lived, you know, upwards of 30 years. Some oak trees will live for a hundred years. There was a cypress tree in Longwood, Florida that was over 2000 years old. Sadly, it got accidentally burnt down, but trees can live for many years. And so you really need to be purposeful when you're pruning trees because, um, you could actually shorten the life of the tree if you're if you don't prune it properly. Okay. So post question number one, I'm gonna launch a poll. And while I'm launching the poll, um, I'm gonna look at the chat box. And so vote. Hopefully, if you didn't know the answer to this before, you now know the answer. Pruning can contribute to plant health problems. So while you're voting. I am going to check chat box. Okay, so I had a question here. Um, can you remind us what the bark ridge is and how to be sure of where that is? Okay. All right. So let me see, most people are voting. I'll give you like 10 more seconds to vote. Okay, so I'm gonna end the polling. I'm going to share. And good news, everybody got this right. <laughs> Up from 79% in the pre-poll. So yes, you're learning, I'm so happy. Okay, so the question about the bark ridge, let me go over that once more. The bark ridge is where the main trunk meets the branch. So your main trunk is here. You have a branch coming off there. The line at which the main trunk and the branch meet, that's your bark ridge. So if you look at it here, um, it's kind of, you see this kind of loop wherever you see that loop you just make a line this is where the branch meets the main trunk and that's how you know how to find the branch bark ridge okay so again pruning in with a purpose pruning with a purpose. <laughs> um, it, you should remove anything that's dead, anything that's dying, anything that has a disease on it, prune it off. You should remove branches that are rubbing or crossing on each other because branches that rub or cross 
wear each other down and become um, hazards when it, you have high wind events. You want to remove water spouts and suckers. Um, Crate Myrtle is famous for just having suckers growing up from the roots. You want to remove those because those are going to be weak wooded. Okay. When you're pruning shrubs, again, same principle. You want to locate the point of origin before your branch removal. So are you just removing the tips of the branches? Are you trying to make the shrub shorter? Because if that's what you're trying to do, you want to go all the way back to the point of origin. Um, or if you're just trying to remove tips to make the hedge wider, then that's a different objective. And so you would remove just the tips. When you're making cuts, you want to make angled cuts above the node. So you're going to find the node. The node is where the leaf or the twig or the stem is attached to the main branch. Find that node, make an angled cut above the node. And then as you're going along, continual, continually reassess the shape um, of your pruning job. Okay. If you're trying to thin out a shrub, then the same principle applies as when you're thinning out the canopy. You want to remove an entire branch all the way back to the main branch. Heading back or reduction, you will remove partial shoots to a point of origin. So you want to make a shoot shorter. You will remove part of the shoot, but when you remove part of the shoot, you're heading back to a point of origin, okay? When you are trying to rejuvenate a shrub, I see this a lot and you will see examples of what not to do when we're talking about rejuvenation. <laughs> you are trying to, um, in trying to kind of reinvigorate the, the plant, but you wanna do it just prior to the start of the growing period and you don't want to remove more than six inches, um, because what you're trying you're what, what you're trying to do you're not trying to stress the plant out. You're just trying to um, get the plant to respond to your pruning by initiating new growth. Um, some plants that go completely dormant. Some of your ornamental grasses do that and you pretty much just cut it all the way down to the ground and that's how it re renews. Um, and there are other plants like that that have like canes um, that have a kind of cane growth habit. You just cut everything back to the ground and then it, it renews in spring. And then um, for your deciduous shrubs, your shrubs that will lose all the leaves, um, you just remove multiple stems or canes, and that will reinvigorate the shrub once dormancy has ended. Okay, so we like to, we like to say that people think that when you prune shrubs, you're giving it a haircut. Um, yes and no. When you're finished pruning a shrub, it should not be obvious that the shrub has been pruned. It should look neat, but you should not see sticks and bare twigs, you know, sticking out of the shrub. That's a poorly pruned shrub, okay? Um, so you can start by making five initial sizing cuts, one on each side of the shrub, and this is what that looks like. My mouse is sensitive, so sometimes it does things that, I don't want it to do just yet, okay? So this is the top view of your shrub. And you will make first cut in the center. You're trying to resize it. And then you'll make matching cuts on each side. If you, if you think of like your cardinal points, your north, north, south, east, west, you'll make matching cuts on all sides. And then you keep going in that manner until the shrub is the right shape that you want it to be, okay? 
I mentioned you want to remove crossing and rubbing branches. This is what we're talking about. You have a branch growing here and it's growing across the canopy. You want to remove that. You want to remove branches that are, are touching or rubbing because um, it just causes injury to the bark and injury to the plant. You want to remove your suckers as well. You want to remove your water sprouts. You want to remove any um, branches that are dead, disease are dying. And if, if the branches that you're removing face upwards, you want to have an angled cut because that way water precipitation will run off and not settle. If you make a horizontal cut, the moisture can settle. And once you have high moisture settling on a branch, it will make the branch more prone to decay and disease. So you wanna make an angle cut, as I mentioned, right above a node. So you look for the node, make a cut above the node, okay? For horizontal stems, the cuts don't have to be angled because, um, you know, the, the risk for moisture settling here on the cut surface of, an, of a horizontal stem is, lim is limited. Okay, all right. So remember when I said, let's start at the beginning. Um, and if you have a good design for your landscape, then you can avoid a lot of pruning problems. Beautiful, beautiful shrub, flowering its heart, flowering to its heart's content. But for a public safety issue, this hedge is gonna have to be pruned because it's growing on the sidewalk, okay? So obviously not the right place for a shrub that's gonna get this wide, okay? Um, a shrub or any other plant will be a low maintenance plant if you put it in the right place. Okay, again, we have nothing wrong with the plant, but it definitely was planted in the wrong place because now you're gonna have to be constantly pruning here to, um, you know, maintain access to the right of way. So definitely planted in the wrong place. Consideration wasn't given to the mature spread of this plant. Um, the plant on the lower picture, um, it's possible that this shrub was planted as a screening hedge, but you know, if you thought that a screening hedge should be four or five feet tall, this shrub is obviously taller than that. Um, and so it's not just screening, it's completely engulfing the structure. And so this is definitely a plant that's gonna have to be continually pruned because it's not in the right place. So when you're pruning to reduce the size of a plant, and we like to say, prevent yourself from having to keep the size of a plant in check because the plant was designed to grow to a certain mature size, okay? So say a native fire bush, it was quote unquote designed, it's in its DNA to grow 12 to 15 feet. You're trying to keep this native fire bush at six feet, you're gonna be fighting a losing battle. You're gonna be constantly pruning this fire bush. It's not gonna be happy because you're always pruning it. Um, it's gonna get stressed out. When it's stressed out, it becomes more susceptible to pests and diseases. So, and when it gets pests and diseases, you're not gonna be happy. So, you know, corny jerk alert, they say happy wife, happy life. Happy plant, happy life. You know, if you're stressing your plants out, you're not gonna be happy, okay? But, in the event that you do need to prune a shrub to reduce its size and keep it a certain size, you wanna start at the longest stem and you wanna cut back into the canopy of the shrub to the point of origin. So this longest stem would actually come back here. 
Um, I know it's tempting to go, oh, this is too long. Let me cut it here. But if you cut it here, then it's going to regrow from here when you cut it. And so that kind of defeats the purpose. Okay. And this is what you do not want to do. <laughs> All right. So um, this is one of the plants I was describing to you that kind of grows with canes. And so you can cut the canes back. You can remove some of the canes or you can cut the canes back to the ground um, when you're pruning. Here is another example of plants that will need to be pruned because your bird of paradise gets very, like I like to call it chunky, it grows really wide. Um, you have a light fixture here that, you know, obviously the light fixture serves a purpose. You're gonna have to be constantly cutting back. And when I say cutting back, cutting it back to the point of origin, which is at the base, in order to keep the light fixture unobstructed. <clears throat> so here, um, this podocarpus is, you know, being maintained in kind of like a ball topiary, but it's growing under the eaves. And so, you know, you're constantly pruning this plant. As a result, it got a hole. This hole you see here is as a result of dieback from a fungus. And so constantly pruning plants um, to reshape them can lead to them getting stressed out and lead, lead to them getting fungal issues. And that kind of defeats the point of a perfect topiary because now you have a hole in the middle of your golf ball. Okay. Um, so this is just an example of thinning as a pruning objective. You want to thin this out. You want to remove what we call dead heading, remove the old flower heads. Um, you can cut this all the way back down and it will regenerate in spring. So to remove dead or severely diseased um, wood would be your objective in renewal pruning. You know, so here it is. You remove like, you know, a lot of the inside of the canopy. And this is good to do when the plant is just um, exiting dormancy. Because when the plant is, is, is dormant, they're just like in a holding pattern. They're not growing or putting out shoots or anything. So just at the end of dormancy, you can do um, a thinning or a rejuvenation pruning job. And um, then once the dormant period is over, you'll get new shoots, okay? So you wanna choose the oldest stems, cut back to about four to six inches. So here you'll see what it looked like and then you cut back four to six inches. Um, you can, like I said, cut back some of the older stems to their point of origin. And then you can cut any branches that extend beyond the canopy shape that you're looking for. When you're doing like a rounded cut, again, as I mentioned, you start at the longest branch, cut six to 24 inches backwards toward the inside of the canopy. Um, but you don't wanna just snip off the new tips of the canopy because um, that's not helpful. You wanna make reduction cuts, the lateral branches that have a lot of foliage. So that's what it looked like before. And then you're gonna make um, cuts to get your finished product. This point is key. If there is a hole, and if your hole, quote unquote, was not um, caused by a disease, let me just, you know, have that caveat there. If your hole was not caused by a disease, oops, my mouse is behaving weird. And you say, you know, you want to fill in here, so you only have three branches, but you want to have it get fuller, 
then you want to make a heading cut at the point where you want it to fill in. Because if you cut here, then new growth is going to reju regenerate from the point at which you cut, because that's how plants work. So when you're reducing the size, you want to cut below your original heading cut. So when the cut was made here, new growth is going to start right here where you cut because you remove the terminal bud, you're going to, which means that you're going to encourage the lateral buds to put out new shoots. So everywhere there's a cut surface, you're going to have new shoots coming out there. So if you want to reduce the size, what you have to do is you have to cut below the original cut. Because when you cut, if you cut here, the new shoots are going to be where my arrow is. And you want to do this in late winter, just when the plants are exiting dormancy or early spring. Um, when you're doing informal hedges, informal hedges tend not to have like a, a, a shape, a defined shape. They tend to have a natural shape. So they're not shaped like a square or a rectangle or a circle or a semicircle. You just allow them to have a natural shape. But what you would do is you would prune off any foliage that's kind of sticking out beyond the canopy. So you want the canopy to kind of have a, a you know, a contained flow. And so you'd prune off anything that's sticking out beyond that. You will make reduction or heading cuts on the longest shoots backwards into the canopy. And then you want to make sure that your lower branches are receiving sunlight so that you will have a full appearance. Because what happens is if the top branches are crowding out the lower branches, then the lower branches are not getting enough light to put new leaves out. And so you'll have a hedge where the top is thicker than the bottom and the bottom is really thin. And that defeats the purpose of a hedge. <laughs> okay, so for formal hedges, you will do regular cuts. And um, those regular cuts, I, I, as I mentioned, are to maintain like, you know, lines, whether it's um, straight lines or circular shapes, that's the objective of a formal hedge cut. And then you'll do regular heading cuts to achieve the shape at the top. So um, you want to make sure that when you're doing pruning for hedges to have regular heading cuts, you want to make cuts that are within an inch of the, of the previous cut you made. So you don't want this hedge to grow 12 inches tall, and then you cut it back. You want to do regular cuts that are removing, um, you know, cuts of an inch to three inches. You don't want to be removing more, more tissue than that. You would, if, you're, if your hedge is a flowering hedge, you want to prune it after flowering because you want to encourage as much flowering as possible. And then this is what we meant when we say, two things are happening here. Um, it wasn't pruned correctly. And so the lower branches don't have a lot of leaves. They have a lot of thinning out there. And then you had um, disease issues happening here where you have um, what we call dieback happening as a result of pruning because Pruning can spread diseases from one plant to another if pruning tools are not properly sanitized. Okay, this is a diagram. What we mean when we say your lower leaves are being crowded out. And this is what the research recommendation is. If you're pruning a hedge, you should prune it in a wedge shape. And so your top, when you look head on, the top of your hedge is actually narrower than the bottom. If you look face 
forward, you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, because it just looks like a hedge. But if you looked from the side, you would see that the top of the hedge is narrower than the bottom and that will prevent the bottom of your hedge from thinning out. And yes, we do know that it's very hard to achieve. <laughs> it's just way easier to go straight up and down with your shares. But this is a recommendation if you wanna keep your hedge vigorous. Okay, so the rejuvenation pruning I mentioned, where you cut back the plant severely, almost no leaves are on the plant when you prune it. Um, but you wanna do it again, just prior to the plant exiting dormancy. And then once it rejuvenates, then you're going to choose which of these branches are gonna be your main branch. Okay, so poll question two, gonna launch a poll and then while you're voting, gonna check the chat box. All right. So pruning, pro proper pruning is objective based. So this is awesome. Everybody got this answer right. And in the pretest, 68% got it right. So I'm so happy. <laughs> okay. So in the chat box, we had a couple questions. Um, so if you accidentally make a small cut in the main trunk, is there something to put on it to help it heal? Um, typically, we would say don't do anything. Just monitor it. It shouldn't be oozing um, any kind of sap or anything like that. Um, trees have a really good way of compartmentalizing wounds. And so um, typically, you just want to leave it be. Okay, is it early enough to prune for garden light exposure? Um, I like to say we should prune, especially here where we are in Florida, you want to prune when the last of the cold weather <laughs> um, is done. And it's so hard to tell when that is because I mean, in theory, you know, mid-March is supposed to be, okay, we're done. No more cold weather. Um, you know, but typically you know, mid-March is when you would want to start pruning, especially if you want to do um, light exposure. Pruning a shrub to make it wider, you want to take off like the first three inches of the shrub because what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove the terminal buds to encourage lateral growth. Okay, pruning a single stem oleander. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you're pruning it to make it branch out or do you want it to be more than a single stem or are you trying to make it not as tall as six feet? So, you know, you can type into the chat and just let me know what is your pruning objective. Water sprouts are what we call adventitious tissue. Um, they're just 
outgrowths, you know, new shoots just shooting off where they're not supposed to shoot off. And so they grow vertically up. They are not growing in the direction of the rest of the, the, the branches, um, the stems and the branches. Um, typically we don't prune vegetable plants unless, so if you have a prized eggplant and you want, it, it's, it, it tends to give you, you know, this variety tends to give you like um, 12 small eggplants, but you want three large eggplants, then you can actually prune off each blossom. And that, what that will do, it will divert all the energy to just three eggplants, three large eggplants versus um, 10 small eggplants. Okay. Um, electric shares. Yes, you can use electric shares to shape your hedges. Um, just aim for, and, and bougainvillea is not one of those hedges that tends to thin out. I mean, bougainvillea tend to grow too much versus mm, not enough. But yeah, electric shares are fine. You just wanna make sure um, that you don't have a situation where the, the bottom of the hedge is being crowded out. Um, and so you have a hedge that's thinner at the bottom than at the top. Okay. Whoa, Catherine, I am going to have to do some digging on your hazelnut question. Um, so if you can send me your email, let me do some digging on your hazelnut question and I will get back to you. I know that our researchers are actually doing um, research on pecans and other um, nut plants. So if you give me your email address, I can do some digging and definitely send you some information. Okay. Okay, so yes, when you say cut back six inches, if you wanna make your hedge wider, you wanna remove six inches from the top of the hedge. That's what you're trying to do. Because what you're doing is you're removing the lateral buds and then it will encourage the, I'm sorry, you're removing the terminal buds, need more coffee. <laughs> and once you remove the terminal buds, it will encourage the lateral buds to shoot out. Um, so you wanna rejuvenate your oleander. If you cut back your oleander, you know, do a really severe cut back, what will happen is it will send out a lot of shoots from the base. And instead of having a single stem plant, you'll have a plant with like, you know, maybe six or seven stems. Um, so I don't know if that's your objective. And the same thing with your Suriname cherry head, you wanna do almost like a rejuvenation pruning where you wanna cut, um, you wanna do like a severe cut back um, and if you hang on for a few minutes after we're done, because I want to get through to the end so people who need to leave can go. If you hang on for a few more minutes, I can go back to that section where we show you um, what the re rejuvenation for woody shrubs will look like. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, let me just go through the next few slides and um, look at the pruning process. So we talked about your three cut method for large branches. We talked about avoiding branch collar cuts. We talked about not having co-dominant leaders. I'll show you what that looks like. And you wanna avoid overlifting when you're pruning trees, okay? So I'm gonna show you pictures of what not to do when you're pruning trees. You wanna avoid what we call lion tailing, which makes the trees weaker. Um, you want to look for U-shaped crotch angles. Sometimes you have no control because the tree naturally has a V-shaped crotch angle, but U-shaped crotch angles are stronger. And so if you have a tree 
with a V-shaped crotch angle, you will um, just know that you might have issues with wind damage, okay? So this is what we mean when we say you have a U-shaped crotch angle versus a V-shape, okay? If you have one of these, it's gonna be weaker because a lot of humidity and moisture can settle here and predispose it to decay. And, and, and so what you would wanna do is you would want to pick one of these sides and prune back, obviously outside of the branch collar, but prune back one of these so that you don't have a lot of moisture settling here. Um, causing decay in both sides of the branch. All right, so this is what we mean by lion tailing, where you've pruned the tree to the point where most of the canopy is concentrated at the tips of the branches and the inner canopy has been removed. You don't wanna do this because in high wind events, um, the wind, here will actually cause shearing and friction on the inside branches and that will um, make the tree more prone to toppling in a high wind event, okay? So that was lion tailing. Here's another picture on the right of lion tailing. You don't wanna do this um, because like I said, the wind, when the, once the wind gets a hold of this, it's almost like you've increased the center of gravity of the tree. And as a result, it's more susceptible to wind damage. On the left, you also don't want to overlift, same issue where it had branches here, but you removed most of the branches. And so the rule of thumb is that you don't wanna have too much of the canopy in the top third of the tree, okay? So you wanna prune it properly so that it will have good form. You wanna avoid this co-dominant leader, as I said, so the picture on the left, you don't wanna have what we call dueling leaders or co-dominant leaders because this um, has issues where one or both of these will have decay issues and um, break off in a wind event. And so you, you pick one, prune off the other one, and so your tree has a central leader and that makes it a stronger tree. So depending on whether your tree is excurrent or decurrent, that will also inform your pruning objective and pruning strategies. When you prune, you wanna have two thirds of the tree is canopy and one third is bare trunk. So this is what it looks like. Your ex current trees have central leaders, so like your magnolias, um, typically your um, pines, typically your ex current trees have what we call multiple scaffold branches. So you do have one main leader but you have a rounded canopy with scaffolding br branches extending into the canopy. And um, so whether your tree is X current or D current, that will inform what your pruning objectives are gonna be, okay? So remember we said half of the foliage should be in the lower two thirds of the tree. So if you think about you know, your canopy as a triangle, not telling you to prune your tree like a triangle, <laughs> um, but you know, half of your foliage is in the lower two thirds, okay? And then the other half is in the upper third of the tree. And then when you're pruning trees, you should not remove more than 25% of the foliage because if, it, if you're doing this in the growing season, because the foliage of the tree and foliage of plants in general is what the plant depends on to produce food through photosynthesis. So when you remove too much foliage, you're actually stressing the plant out because you've removed 
its source of food. Okay, so we always like to say that, you know, plants are like puppies. They do need to be trained. You do want to not neglect your trees and your shrubs. And so we talked about co-dominant leaders where you had two leaders. This tree has like five or six leaders. Definitely should have been addressed prior to it getting to this situation. It makes the tree unstable. And then in high wind events, it causes a lot of property damage, okay? So when you're pruning, you want to prune, train your tree to have a dominant leader, central leader. And this is especially true for like your peaches. You want to have um, multiple, you want to have proper spacing between the branches because you want to have room for your peaches to fruit. Peaches and plums, um, the way you prune them is influenced by, you know, how they bear fruit and how they're going to be harvested, okay? This here is what happens when you do not address your co-dominant leaders. So you have what we call bark inclusion, where this leader is... Um, Ab absorbing some of the bark from the other leader and vice versa. And so you have this bark here is a co-mingling of bark from both leaders. And so you don't want to have co-dominant leaders. That's bad for your tree, okay? So you have bark inclusion. Want to make a pruning cut to prevent um, co-dominant leaders. Make sure it's outside the branch collar. You also want to address any kind of bark inclusion that you see going on, okay? So again, let us look at what are ob what are um, our objectives. Definitely need more coffee when we're pruning. So um, when you're pruning your tree, you are thinking of an end goal in mind, and end goals are in mind. And then what you're doing is you're starting when the tree is young to help it achieve this end goal. When you realize that, oops, we didn't train, we didn't prune a tree when it was young. No, it's all wild and carefree and doing weird things. And you try to prune it when it's mature, what can happen is that it does not compartmentalize fully because the wound is too big. I mean, these branches now are 12 inches in diameter. It's really hard for the tree to seal this wound. And so it only becomes partially sealed. And then you have incidences where you have decay and then the, the lifespan of the tree is shortened, okay? Um, in many communities, there are urban foresters that are that have the responsibility of making sure that trees do not impact um, public safety. And so they'll do canopy lifting, canopy reduction, etc. And they'll actually have a pruning plan for maintaining what we call street trees. They will actually do structural pruning to help um, maintain the safety of street trees. Okay, so some of you might be familiar with these pictures because you see it a lot. Um, a lot of people prune, create, create myrtles like this. Um, some people don't like it, you know, because they say it stresses out the tree. That is true, it does. It does stress out the tree because as I mentioned, when you remove all the foliage, um, you're remo removing the, the plant's food source. But there are some areas where, you know, um, the crepe myrtle will be completely dormant. And so, you know, you can prune it. But severe pruning like this is generally not recommended because what happens is you'll get new growth coming out all at the same time from these spots. And the growth is not going to be, it's going to be 
just one year's growth. And so it's not gonna have, you know, the strength of say the woody portions of the plant. And so you're gonna have what we call a weak wooded um, growth coming out. But we do know why people do this. It's so that once the new shoots start to flower, you'll get flowers everywhere. Everything will flower at the same time. And so that's really the method behind the madness. Um, but it can cause the, the tree to be stressed out. All right. And so that picture we just showed you is what we call a hat racking because the pictures look like a hat rack. Um, these are some of the disadvantages of hat racking your crepe myrtles. Um, it can delay flowering because remember now that everywhere you have cut, the plant now has the first energy on sealing the wound and regrowing shoots because it has no leaves um, to make food. You might have um, decreased flowering, depending on the severity of the pruning. And then you're going to have a lot of sprouts coming up from the base because the sprouts are a response to the plant being in stress. The plant is saying, I need some green leaves. That's how I get food. And so it's just going to send out um, sprouts from the base to put out leaves so the plant can get some food. So which of these trees is more wind tolerant? Would you say the tree on the left or the tree on the right? You can type it into your chat. Tree on the left or tree on the right? Which one is more wind tolerant? And while you're typing in, I'm going to look. Okay. Yes, almost everybody's getting it right. Yes. Um, the tree on the right is more wind tolerant because you don't have that co-dominant leader. Um, as you mentioned. And um, I know Betty asked a question about pruning frangipani. And again, Betty, um, what is your objective? You know, are you trying to make it shorter? Are you wanting to put up more branches? What is your objective? It, you should always have an objective in mind when you're pruning anything. So you can type in the chat, let me know what is your objective. Okay, in the chat, which tree's health is compromised? Um, is it the tree on the right or is it the tree on the left? Okay, I'm seeing people putting in the type the right answers. Okay, all right, great. So everybody said, well, almost everybody said both. Both of these trees have compromised health because the wounds were not properly sealed. You can see the inner bark where if I can see it, a fungus can grow in it, <laughs> okay? So you can have um, fungal issues here. Um, and Betty, I'll get to your question about pruning frangipani um, in a few minutes. Okay, so we always like to talk about palms when we're talking about pruning, okay? In the chat box, which of these palms are properly pruned? Is it the palm on the right or the palm on the left? Okay, keep typing in. Okay. Okay, I'm so glad to hear that. Okay, so what's interesting is that the palm on the left is properly pruned. The palm on the right is not properly pruned, even though most palms are pruned like the one on the right. But this is wrong. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why in a bit. Okay, 
suspense. <laughs> um, take this poll and then I'll tell you more about why the palms, the palm on the right was not pruned properly, okay? So, let me see. Air launch polling. Growing seasons impact pruning decisions. Okay, keep voting. Okay, so let's see where we are. Great. And everyone got this question right, as opposed to 96% in the pre poll. So good. All right. So let's let me talk some more about palm pruning. Okay. The reason, let me go back here. The reason we don't want you to prune like the picture on the right is because, as I mentioned, anything that's green on a plant, the plant's using it to make food, okay? So the plant on the left has a lot of food. <laughs> enough food, it's able to make enough food to sustain this palm that's 12 or 15 feet tall palm on the right does not have enough food to sustain growth, okay? If I asked you to look at an oak tree and tell me how many leaves it had on it, you would look at me like I was crazy. And yes, I would be crazy if I asked you to tell me how many leaves are on an oak tree. When you look at a palm, a properly pruned palm, you should not be able to tell how many leaves, or we call them fronds, are on the palm. And this picture, I can tell you, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine fronds. This is how you know the palm is not properly pruned. This palm does not have enough fronds to support the growth that it needs because it's, it's relying on these fronds to make food support the growth. I wouldn't even begin to count how many fronds are on the picture on the left. And this is why this palm is not properly pruned. All right, so grasses I mentioned, you can cut them all the way down to the ground. It is best for you to cut them all the way down to the ground because they go dormant when it gets cold. We're not gonna do anything. And so if you leave them and don't cut them down, you're actually um, getting in the way of them being triggered to put up new growth. So you wanna cut them down and then they will go, oh, time to grow new light leaves and they will rejuvenate, okay? Um, so as I mentioned, When you're pruning a palm, you shouldn't be able to tell how many fronds are on it. That's a properly pruned palm. I know I'm going to get a lot of um, comments in the chat box because we have a lot of palms in Florida and people like to prune them the way I said, don't prune them. You are um, considered pruning a palm in an acceptable manner if you prune anything below the horizon, anything below 180 degree horizon, if you prune below that, that's acceptable because those are the older fronds. But the ideal, the ideal stage of pruning a palm is to prune it when only the older leaves have turned completely brown. That's the ideal stage of pruning a palm. So again, I know it's a bit controversial because a lot of landscapers have contracts 
with the HOA to prune. The HOA says, you must prune once a year. You must prune twice a year. And so the landscapers will say, well, they tell us to prune and so we prune. But a properly pruned palm does not have anything pruned above that 180 degree line where you see my arrow. Properly pruned palm does not have anything pruned above that line. Okay, so a properly pruned palm is supposed to have 360 degree of green fronds. Okay, properly pruned palm, 360 degree fronds. This is an improperly pruned palm on the left. Okay, so you, it is acceptable, like I said, to prune anything below the 180 degree line. It is also acceptable to remove anything that's brown because it means the plant's done with it. I'm done. This plant, this leaf can no longer make food. It's old. It's like how you have gray hair. Frond is brown. It needs to be discarded. The flowers have all been spent or the fruit have been spent. You can remove that. I always say to people too, um, this is more for our palm session, but I just like to slip this in on this section, that if you're not going to be using the fruit, the palm fruit for anything, so, you know, you don't want the palm fruit to be there for birds and squirrels and raccoons. Some people like to have wildlife in their yards. And so you can leave the fruit on if you were providing fruit for wildlife or if you're gonna be eating the coconuts. If you're not planning to use the fruit for anything, if you don't want the fruit to get red and ripen and fall off the tree, or yellow and ripen and fall off the tree, prune the fruit off when they get to the size of a grape. Because if you don't, the tree is gonna be putting nutrients into making that fruit mature making the fruit get bigger, making the fruit turn from green to red or yellow. And basically you're just wasting nutrients because the plant's gonna take up nutrients from the soil, put all of that energy into maturing fruit that you are gonna prune off later. And so prune off the fruit if you're not gonna use them or if you don't want them to ripen, prune them off when they get to the size of a grape. Um, we always recommend that you leave the flowers. And so once the palm starts to flower, don't prune the flowers. We always like to recommend leave the flowers on for pollinators, a lot of bees um, get nectar from palm flowers. And so please help us to save pollinators. When you save the pollinators, you save yourself, okay? But again, where my arrow is, do not prune a palm like this. Don't do it. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, did I say don't do it? I said don't do it, okay? So if you're gonna prune a palm, you can pr prune anything below that 180 degree line, degree line that nine to three o'clock hands on a clock face, nine to three pruning, we call it. Um, if you live in an HOA that says, well, we pay our landscapers to prune, so they must prune. Um, they should, you should, in the contract, you should say only brown leaves, flower stalks should be pruned or only fronds that are below that 180 degree line or the nine to three on a clock face should be pruned, okay? And yes, I am repeating myself, but um, we tend to do that a lot so that, you know, our concepts will sink in. Okay, please note, if your palms have been damaged by the cold, do not prune off the cold damage fronts. Yes, they look bad, they look brown, they don't look green, but do not prune them off. Um, the plant's under stress. The plant 
is relying on whatever little green tissue it still has to photosynthesize and make nutrients that it can, I mean, and make food that it can put towards putting out new leaves. So do not prune anything off until you see new leaves emerge because the tree is still relying on these, you know, sad looking fronds to make leaves. And so don't prune them off. Okay, so as we wrap up, we're just gonna talk a little bit about pruning tools and um, launch our last poll question. And then um, I'll get to any other chat questions you have in, I mean, questions you have in the chat box. Okay, so we talked about pruning objectives. Let's look at our tools. You can have bypass or anvil pruners. You can have loppers, shares. You want to use landscaping saws. Um, carpentry saws are usually for when, you know, like you're, you've already cut the limb down and you want to, you know, make, make um, the wood more easy to carry. You can use a pole saw. You can use a chainsaw, but you should not use it on branches that are unstable and can fall and injure, you know, persons or property. Okay. So from the top left, here are your bypass hand pruners, hedge trimmers in the middle, folding pruning saw, bottom right pole saw, middle loppers, left chainsaw. So when we're talking about hand pruners, as I mentioned, you have two types. You have your anvil pruner and you have your bypass pruner. And each is good for different reasons, okay. Sorry, my screen got stuck. <laughs> Give me one second. Like I said, my mouse has a mind of its own. So let's get back to where we were talking about anvil pruners. Ta-da, here we are, anvil pruners, right. Okay, so yeah, each of these will be better suited for different situations. Here is your here is your bypass pruner compared to your anvil pruner. So your anvil pruners will cut plant material similar to how a knife would cut an object on a cutting board. And so what you have, if you look on your, the chart at the top here, if you cut a, a celery stalk on a cutting board, there is what we call a crush zone on either side. Where the knife hits a stalk of celery, you have a crush zone on the right side, crush zone on the left side, okay? Anvil pruners prune like that. Your bypass pruners, will cut the plant material similar to how a pair of scissors would cut an object. And so one blade bypasses the other. And so when you cut it, you have a crush zone only on one side. And so you're going to use the bypass pruner, position it in such a way that the part of the stem that you're gonna cut off is the part that's on the side of the crush zone. And so bypass pruners are best for woody plants. So this is a woody plant. You're gonna have a lot of um, force when, you, when you're using a bypass pruner, a lot of force trying to cut a woody plant. You wanna make sure that the crush zone is on the discarded part of the stem and not on the part of the stem that's gonna remain on the plant. Okay, so here are, so woody bypass pruners are better for woody shrubs and, 
anvil pruners are best for like you know your soft if you're like deadheading flowers um annuals that kind of thing okay um your loppers your hand length will dictate how much leverage you have to prune you know like heavier branches you can use loppers with um telescopic handles like this um, you can use head shares. Head shares will be best for soft tissue, not woody tissue. So if you just want to take off the, the top tips, the top six inches um, of some of the hedge, you can use head shares. But nothing woody um, will work. Okay. Pruning saws, you have curved blades, you have fixed blades, you have um, large tooth saws, and they're angled. These are just some examples of um, sharpening units you can purchase. You should make sure that your pruning tools are sharp because as I said, whenever you prune, you're actually wounding the plant and a clean cut will heal more quickly than a jagged cut. And, and when, we come, when it comes to pruning plants, you want, and I keep saying heal, I mean seal, they seal off the wound, it doesn't heal, it seals off. Um, you want a clean cut to seal quickly because the more quickly a cut will seal, the less likely it is to, um, be infected with pathogen, plant pathogens, okay? And then these are just some other examples of sharpening tools that you would, you, you if you have pruning tools and you prune, you should get the tools sharpened, okay? Wait, oops, totally my mouse was thing was sensitive. Okay, so this is the last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, Let me launch the poll and this is it. Anvil pruners work best for pruning woody shrubs. True or false? And while you're voting, I will look in the chat box. Okay. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, can you use knife sharpeners on your bypass pruners? You should be able to um, use, if you have one of those straight knife sharpeners, um, I tend to call them like file sharpeners. Yeah, you should be able to use um, a knife sharpener on the, the blade edge. Okay, so I'm gonna end polling and the answer is false. Anvil pruners work best for soft plants, you know, um, not woody plants, okay? All right, so before I let you go, um, I usually hang on for a few minutes after we end for other questions, but we, these are some additional resources. Um, we have a Florida friendly landscaping guide I will put the links in the chat box. Um, if you need to find a certified arborist, you can do so um, here. And um, if you wanna learn more about trees and, and the benefits of trees to our communities, we offer a tree rejuvenation program that provides more information on that. Certified arborists take um, a four hour certification exam. And so there's a, actually a list of certified arborists. You click on it and you type your zip code in and it will help you to find someone who is certified to properly train, to properly prune a tree, okay? 
Um, these arbors also can help you to assess whether you should put a tree back up if it's blown over or if you should remove it, okay? Um, and what they will do is they will look to see if the tree can be saved by looking at the canopy. Is the canopy, if the, so if the tree is on its side, you know, it have the roots are out. If the canopy is brown, the tree probably can't be saved. Um, but certified arborists will take a look using this list of criteria and um, will help you to decide, do you want to save the tree or not, okay? This is just some more information on tree permitting. If you need to remove a tree, you do need to um, contact your local municipality for tree permits. And the last corny joke, if you need a pair of free pruners, this pair of free pruners will get the job done. It's just that they might prune things you don't want to be pruned, but <laughs> if you're looking for a pair of free pruners, these will get the job done, okay? And with that, I'm gonna put our survey link in the chat box. Please take our survey. So once again, thanks for joining us. It was great to have you here and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.